welcome to another op- episode of Biohacking Beauty Podcast. My name is Amitai. I am the host, CEO, and co-founder of Young Goose, uh, which is the biohacking skincare company, which this podcast is by. I am so happy you're with me today. Um, my guest today is the amazing Dr. John Kim. Dr. John Kim is a functional medicine pharmacist and head clinical pharmacist of Robinson Wellness Pharmacy in New Jersey. As a pharmacist and uh, specialist in functional medicine, preventive healthcare, and CBD, Dr. Kim is surely the man to trust when it comes to our pharmaceutical and healthcare needs. Um, A little bit about him. He has been in clinical practice for 15 years, and he has been the foremost voice in health, wellness, and uh, preventative medicine. I specifically am addicted to consuming his content. He received his uh, doctorate in pharmacy from Rutgers University with high honors and trained in functional medicine from the American Academy for Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M. Uh, He's He actively lectures throughout the country and is an influencer within functional medicine, the functional medicine world to educate and empower everyday people to live healthy, fulfilling life. His message is doctor of the future is you, the patient, which I wholeheartedly agree with. We're going to be uh, doing a deep dive into the relationship between our overall health and hormones, uh, which obviously is very interesting. It should be interesting to to everyone. Um, We touch a little bit towards the end uh, how it relates to our skin health and youth, but uh, most of it is a holistic approach uh, to keeping our our hormones and body in check. You learn um, how to take care of your gut in order to balance your hormones, why we need to, uh, what are the steps we need to take, not only in order to balance our hormones, but also to make sure that every hormone therapy that we're going to be engaging in is actually effective and uh, how it looks like when it is effective, when we do take uh, good care of our hormones. So there's a lot to learn in this conversation. Uh, about hormone optimization from the inside out. Um, Before we go into this deep dive, uh, it would mean, I want to let you know, it would mean the world to me and to us here at Young Goose if you took two seconds out of your day to subscribe to the podcast. Not only uh, does this ensure you'll never miss an episode, but also greatly helps the growth of the podcast. So everyone uh, else that can enjoy this information uh, we'll have, uh, we'll know about it and have access to it. Uh, last but not least, I'm reminding you that this podcast is brought to you by Young Goose, the biohacking skincare product. All right, so Dr. John Kim, uh, welcome to the Biohacking Beauty Podcast. I'm very excited to to have you on. Emmett, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I'm excited about the topic that we're discussing about today. I know we've been going back and forth trying to set up a podcast, and now here we are. We're finally able to get that something scheduled. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the main, the bulk of what we're going to be aiming to talk about today is uh, is hormones, like hormone health, and um, this is a, a subject that is near and dear to my heart as someone that is that is approaching his late uh, 30s, starting to understand that, um, that, that, you know, my hormonal balance uh, is, is, is something that I should be cognizant of and checking. But also uh, having a skincare company, understanding that uh, my, my customer's hormonal uh, health is detrimental to, to the results that our skincare gets. So, what are the ranges of of people that that um, kind of approach you as far as like uh, balancing their horm- hormones, the hormone and health? Do you see like every age group? So the issue that we see a lot of times is that people end up having to look at just the results of people who are using hormones mm. versus actually looking at the overall roadmap in terms of what 
it takes to rebalance in their overall hormone, right? Because the hormonal issue that you might be facing now in dealing with the fact that, let's just take female patients, for instance, mm-hmm. having severe hot flashes, weight gain, not able to handle their overall stress that well, uh, they're having thyroid issues, their energy levels low, fatigue, etc. All those things didn't just happen overnight. Mm-hmm. And so one thing that we have to really address with patients is that these things that you're looking to achieve, it takes time. And that is something that I always end up having to relate to them. It's like, hey, you know what, can I just use hormones and be done with it? Yeah, you know what, that was my overall 15 year fifteen years ago in terms of what I looked at. Hey, you, you know what, I just need to optimize estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone to help with people. But there's a lot more issue behind the hormonal dysfunction or the imbalance of the patient I'd be dealing with so we have wide range of people coming into the pharmacy or even when I do a, a, a you know, private consultation or one-on-one and really depends. And so one thing that I really look at when I approach a patient is what are the symptoms you're actually having? And the second thing is what are you trying to achieve, right? Mm-hmm. If a patient comes in and she is, let's just take a female patient again. Yeah. She having issue with weight gain, stress, they can't sleep. And then having severe anxiety issues, that's a very different picture where I need to address adrenal issues on top of um, low progesterone level. A lot of these patients are estrogen dominant, meaning that's mm-hmm. a higher estrogen level compared to progesterone. And really le- looking to fix the overall gut is- issue as well. You know, 90% of your serotonin is made in your gut. And so when you have a gut inflammation and as well as a leaky gut, which I always talk about, Mm-hmm. That can cause a downward spiral effect in terms of inflammation, leading into high cortisol response, leading into hormonal imbalance, and then you have anxiety issues as, as such because there's a huge connection between the gut and the brain axis that one thing that I always encourage people to do is if you're going to fix your overall hormonal issue, you need to fix the gut problem even before heading into it. So, you know, proper eating and and as well as detoxing, pooping. I mean, those are things like the basic things that we might be thinking of, but people don't do that every single day. And that's where the hindrance comes in in terms of balance their hormones. And it's not an easy thing, but it can be achieved as long as people are committed and focused in terms of achieving the optimal health. Uh, very, very interesting because actually when you were talking before you started explaining it, I wanted to kind of play dumb and ask you, well, why do people need to do so much to balance the hormones? Why can't there just be uh, a literal silver bullet? Like just, okay, just give me, you know, just balance them out. Just give me the hormones that I need in order to have, you know, the correct numbers on my blood work panel or, or something like that. And I'll be good to go. Just pop a couple pills or whatever, inject myself with something every few days and I'll be good to go. Why is it more complicated than that? Because your hormone is like a perfect symphony, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're, you're not just dealing with estrogen and progesterone. You're also dealing with cortisol. You're dealing with DHEA, testosterone, insulin function. It is Insulin is also a hormone as well. We keep mm-hmm. forgetting about that, right? If there's an underlying insulin resistance going on, that also affects your cortisol response. So mm-hmm. that has to be looked at. You also have to look at thyroid. Yeah. Right. You have to look at vitamin D level. All these things are coming into play in optimizing your hormones. And it's just not, I, I don't even sometimes like, like to say the word optimizing hormone because this could be misinterpreted as saying, hey, you know, I just need to follow numbers yeah. and get the your youngest level of my estrogen possible to get the best life that they need to achieve. But that's not the case at all. So you need to look at how we balance it. So everything has to come into play. And if the doctor that you're working with or any practitioner you're working with is not looking at overall the bigger picture of your hormones, that they're doing it incorrectly. And you know what? I made my mistakes as well. When I first started out doing hormone consultation back in 15 years ago after doing my fellowship in anti-aging and functional medicine, I thought just giving progesterone or just giving estrogen and just following numbers would be the trick. But you know what? I made a lot of mistakes where patients end up having to feel worse on hormones than anything. And so yeah. I end up having to step back and really looking at what's causing that particular hormonal imbalance and looking at the root cause problem 
rather than just giving hormones because hormones is only a small bit of a picture and you should not be following like Suzanne Summers out there mm -hmm. and try and say, hey, you know what? I need to optimize a hormone to my 20s uh, to get the best life possible. But science so far has not said that that's the safest way to do it, mm -hmm. nor is it optimal for everybody because you have to look at the overall function dealing with, again, inflammation, gut function, um, looking to balancing your overall hormone and you know getting your quality of life back. And in terms of having the right energy level to exercise, to live well, you know, enjoy your personal life, including sex, right? These are things that should be done instead of just giving, hey, you know what? I need to give all these hormones and try to look, look buff. If that is your yeah. goal, great. It's not going to last too long. Not only that, I, I really, I truly, obviously, uh, I am surrounded with professional athlete, athletes. I, I, I'm very, very, I'm in love with, with, with sport and, and being active. And um, obviously, I'm very sensitive to, um, I mean, like using uh, hormones in sports and stuff like that because of, because of the surrounding that, that I have. And I think there is also a different level of like self-respect or self-love or whatever you want to call it, which leads obviously to happiness and fulfillment, whether you're doing something in like a holistic um, approach where you're really taking care of the person, you're taking care of yourself or you're just, you know, essentially like pressing a button, like an Amazon button to, you know, to get something into your system and uh, get it over with and continue, you know, shoving donuts or whatever that that may be that that you're into and like like to do. So I, I completely agree. G going going into like um, gut function, you mentioned gut, gut function and anyone listening to this podcast um, would know how how much we're trying to emphasize that um is it something that when you understand that someone has a hormonal imbalance or just their body is is basically working suboptimally do you just approach it do you just assume they have leaky gut do you just say okay let's uh do some uh, leaky gut protocol be just in case how do you approach leaky gut or the gut function in general so that is a tough discussion to make a lot of times because patients mm -hmm. come in and then they want to just fix their hormones. But yeah. then, you know, you, you have this practitioner right now in front of you end up having to talk about, Hey, you have deep, leaky gut. So that that's a, uh, that's a very different discussion. So, I, you know, obviously I want to respect the person in front of me. Yeah. The one thing that I ask is like, what is your overall goal for your health? And what is, what is your, what is your overall intention to achieve? when you actually are seeing me for a consultation. So that, that has to be number one. But number two is that everything leads to the gut, right? Yeah. So you cannot leave it alone in that sense of that. Did they want to ask, you know, just give an example of a case where, and this is a very common case that happens a lot, yeah. where, you know, you do a salivary hormone testing and it comes back as being, you know, very um, high cortisol level throughout the entire day. And then this patient actually has severe anxiety, mm -hmm. having to have high estradiol level, right? There's different different forms of estro estrogen, but there's a uh, one that I specifically look at is called estradiol, mm -hmm. and then low progesterone level, right? Th that's a typical typical picture of a patient who are actually dealing with the fact that they have estrogen dominancy, they have high cortisol, so I call it the adrenal stress, right? And these patients yeah. are basically stress junkies, fight or flight, right? Constant to move. And they can't really calm themselves down, resulting in the fact that they have severe anxiety. They're completely bloated all the time when they eat something. Uh, they cannot have a proper bowel movement. You know, if you have a high cortisol level, what happens is that it also affects your overall gut. Stress response affects your overall gut microbiome, right? Yeah. If your gut microbiome is not happy, then <laughs> your, your, your overall gut function is not going to work to par, right? That's not even talking about enzymes or anything of that nature. But you have to look at all these things. So everything leads into the gut function. So I, I tell patients like, hey, in order for you to metabolize your estrogen well, right, depending on estrogen being a good form, I mean, you could make it really complex, but make it simple as possible is that if you want to make a good estrogen metabolite, you need to have the right fibers. You need to have the right prebiotic and postbiotic. You need to actually have the good liver function to, to detox things correctly. Mm -hmm. That overall uh, 
metabolism is determined by, you know, phase one, phase two detox pathway on top of the gut bacteria and overgrowth of yeast can actually mm -hmm. cause a recirculation of the estrogen throughout the hepatic recirculation system, which can actually increase your estrogen in the body, right? So that's already causing a high level of estrogen compared to progesterone. And that's all related to the gut function, gut, liver, and, you know, everything else that that in itself is a tip top, uh, probably the most important point that I'm not having to look at and try to explain to patients that they have to eat well, they have to eat poop well, they need to take care of the overall detox pathway, and that's all related to the gut. And then once you're able to optimize that, then, then helping to do estrogen replacement and as well as to controlling your cortisol level, including controlling your insulin response will be much, much easier compared to not doing all those work and then just throwing in some estrogen progesterone. Yeah. It gets really complex, but that's tr what I'm trying to simplify for patients because that's not what's being taught, or at least it is being taught, but it's not being relayed by doctors because it takes a lot of work. Yeah, so, so I think um, one of the questions are how many people are willing to do this shift? I guess it also depends on, you know, how ready they are, right? Like how, how much they've had it. Um, and maybe that's when they are getting in consultation with you. So maybe you're not the right guy to ask because they're already kind of, kind of are willing to go through the transformation when they meet you. But do you see a lot of people who it's too much for them? Like just taking care of their health is too much for them. And, and what, some of, what are some of the tools that you give them uh, in order to, um, to succeed in the end goal? Because it does seem... We, we've only started, we're like 10 minutes in, and we've already said like, look, this guy needs to overhaul or, or woman needs to overhaul the way that they treat their, their gut. So how many people uh, tell you, well, that's too hard, or what, what are some of the tools that, that, you can, uh, that you can help them with? Sure. So first thing I ask is like, how many, I mean, the best question I'd probably ask is, are you pooping daily? Mm -hmm. Right? That's a simple question I could ask for a patient, right? It's a very dis, dis, um, ingenuous sometimes, but in many cases, it's, a dis, uh, it's an uncomfortable conversation to actually have a person in front of you who have ne you've never met, right? Yeah. That, that's a very intimate thing to discuss about, <laughs> including sex. But um, talking about you know, how well you're able to poop, are you, are you pooping on a daily basis? If so, how good of the quality of a poop, right? If you're actually having to have little, uh, you know, uh, little pellets of, of poop that you're uh -huh. producing, that's not good either. And then if you're constantly having constipation, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And if you're having constant diarrhea problem, that's also another problem as well. So that in itself, that really helps to show that there's an underlying gut problem. And then the second question would be, are you bloated after you eat something, especially if you're having high fiber diet, are you able to digest that? Or let's right. just say if you're having meat, are you able to break that down properly? Because sometimes if you're having a large amount of protein that can cause a lot of bloating, as well as smarty, uh, smelly fart, right? That's another uncomfortable mm -hmm. conversation that you have. But that in itself really helps to show that, hey, you're having initial gut issue to begin with. It's not just a hormone they have to fix right now. The gut function is not optimized and you cannot detox estrogen correctly then you're not able to get your hormones optimized. And that's a big problem. So that's the first discussion that I actually have and the questions that I end up having to ask because that's going to show them. He's like, oh, you know what? I have some gut issues. Oh, it's not normal for me to not have a bowel movement on a daily basis. Right? So that's the first discussion, discussion I actually have to have. Second is what kind of food are you eating? What is your overall favorite diet to actually have? Are you mm -hmm. craving sugar? Are you craving uh, salt? Right? Those are second portion of the food that I have to look at. Then I have to address about, hey, we need to do something called the elimination diet where you need to get rid of the sugars. You need to get rid of anything that is containing gluten and casein and really helping to achieve that anti-inflammatory diet. And I make it simple too on that one. Do a plain paleo diet. I mean, you could go keto, you could go carnivore, all these things. That's really cumbersome, okay? And mm -hmm. then another thing is that a lot of people cannot tolerate eating red meat all the time, right? If the gut function is not up to par at this point in time, you need to do it really, really slowly. 
one thing I like to do is paleo because it, it gives you all the necessary benefit of the fruits and vegetables that you need. And you mm-hmm. got to pick the right fruits and vegetables because certainly a nice shades can be inflammatory. If you have start eating food that are high in oxalates that can also cause yeast overgrowth and as well as um, inflammation, mm-hmm. right? So those are things that should be avoided. But there are, it's generally fruits are very nutritious and easy to digest, right? especially oh. watermelon, mango, and bananas. Oh, that's that's interesting. So you, you said a few things. You said, well, going over, I think uh, you just giving a label of paleo is very good. Be- because especially let's say if I put myself in someone's shoes that that is talking to you because this is um, I think every every diet someone chooses every lifestyle is it, it can be turned into a, like a pseudo religion right I mean other people are, are participating in it and there there's a lot of discussion around it and you can find your community so paleo is like one of those things that the community is there um, recipes are there it's very easy to plug and play so i i really like that so you you did you did go over um casein and um gluten uh could you could you explain uh casein specifically and um well i'll ask you a, a question after that but uh most people would would not would not have heard that word before sure so Gluten is basically the the wheat protein they're going to get, right? So that in itself is very different. I mean, I don't know how many of your listeners are in the United States and how many of are in Europe, Mm -hmm. but the gluten content and ways genetically modified is very different in the United States versus Europe. Mm -hmm. So if you have a standard American diet, you're and eating genetically modified gluten, that is going to cause severe inflammation in your gut in itself. Okay. Even if even if you're not sensitive to gluten in air nope. quotes, it's, it's not the sense. It's not the fact that you have celiac disease. It's just sensitivity to it. Yeah. Right. So that in itself cause uh, and, and when you look at the overall content, like zonulin, for instance, that also can be run through a stool testing. It checks for leaky gut issues. Mm-hmm. Right. And heavy inflammation that's coming from food and it does it and not heavy inflammation i call it the micro inflammation so mm-hmm. this is my inflammation that's happening over time yeah. leading into your degradation of the of the gut lining which causing the leaky gut and once you have a leaky gut you actually have food particles and certain amino acids and proteins end up having to bypass the barrier and going directly into the bloodstream which can actually alarm your immune systems to react yeah. And then when you're adding in things like lipoprotein saccharide, which is partially gram-negative bacteria, that can add in additional problems. And there's a common, common picture of a standard American gut function that we see mm-hmm. at this point. So when you're adding in gluten, additional gluten on top of that, and you have heavy processed gluten everywhere these days, including gum, where wow. this is going to cause a big problem. And then when you're talking about gluten, gluten actually has something called a glidomorphone. Is particular protein, which is similar structure to morphine as well, right? So morphine, when you're taking high amounts of morphine or even just taking a small prescription of Percocet after having a tooth extraction, for instance, mm-hmm. it causes constipation because it, it slows down the peristalsis, which is basically your stomach motility slowing mm-hmm. down. So that causes constipation. That also causes for you to have a very poor gut function. Right, so any person, any patient that walks in, like, hey, I'm having constipation issues. First thing I need to do is get rid of that gluten, and as well as including casein, which is a milk protein, right? Yeah, that can also cause stomach motility to slow down because of casein which is a very similar structure to um, morphine, which can actually affect the mu receptors in your gut and slows down the stomach motility as well. So mm-hmm. when you're having kids. Even kids actually having severe constipation issues, best thing you could do is get rid of the gluten and as well as casein, which is milk, and help to eliminate those things and then helping to reset their overall gut function would end up having to be helpful. And that's one thing that I do with hormone patients. And then I ask them, what kind of diet do they have? Uh, is it filled with gluten and, and casein? Then those are things that need to be eliminated first, followed by corn. Right, mm-hmm. corn can be very um, reactive, especially American corn. Soy, obvious reasons. 
can be very inflammatory. You know, mm -hmm. Asian soy, or if you get soy from Japan and Korea, is very different compared to the soys that are grown in the United States, which are heavily genetically modified, and it's not shown to have the same benefit as mm -hmm. the Asian soy studies that have been shown. So mm -hmm. I don't like to really promote that anymore. Yeah. Then, then several other things like processed meat, processed food, um, high fructose corn syrup, and then um, you know honey could be good because there's very therapeutic for that. But high fructose corn syrup or refined sugar or even brown sugar should be eliminated for about six weeks uh, until the gut is somewhat reset, and then having to slowly reintroduce if it needs to. But when you're having cortisol issues, your insulin function is completely out of whack. So I don't like to recommend sugar as much or basically eliminate it and really optimizing the mineral content as well. Um, so I do have an all-in-one liquid mineral that I add in to actually help with them and actually help them you know, hydrate properly at, at the same time. So yes, it, it is simple. It's just it's, it, initially when you look at it, I'm like, oh crap, this is a lot of work because I've never done it before. Yeah. It's like exercise. Yeah. So it's interesting. And normal, but normally with exercise, you can introduce it very slowly, right? Like you can go to the gym. Normally, if someone has never trained before, you actually um, tell them, okay, just, you know, for a couple of weeks, just get yourself to the gym, do something for five minutes and just get the habit in. Here we're talking about more like, you know, starting very strong, like eliminating everything that needs to be eliminated, uh, you know, gluten, casein, corn, any infl like nightshades, anything inflammatory. Um, is it something that you can also have someone get gradually into or are, you're saying, you know, s starting uh, after this consultation, you know, bear in mind, these foods are not getting into your body for six weeks or forever. That is a tough discussion to actually have with patients as well, because, you know, it's like, I don't have that much gluten. I'm like, no, you need to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you need to get rid of it. It's like throwing a kerosene, right? Pouring kerosene into a small fire. What's going to do? It's going to blow up. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that is an analogy I rec tell patients that you need to get rid of the gluten because it's really blowing up your gut at this point. And that's not really helping your hormones to optimize. Mm -hmm. so that's the overall discussion that I actually have. So it's, it can't, it, when you're doing elimination diet, you cannot do a gradual elimination diet. You need to just mm -hmm. basically quit it. And to give them a simple guideline, just as I mentioned before, doing paleo diet can be very helpful. Right. Or doing whole 30 diet can be helpful. Whole mm -hmm. 30, uh, they do still recommend oxalates. I don't like to use oxalates or at least to introduce oxalates for a short period of time because if they if if I end up having to suspect any dealing with yeast overgrowth in the gut uh, and trying to help to calm the gut down, oxalates I usually never have to take out these days. You know, mm -hmm. before I didn't have much understanding of that, but I'm seeing more and more that patients are very reactive to oxalates like kale, spinach, uh, white potatoes, and those are filled with oxalates, which can be inflammatory to your gut. So eliminating that until you're able to get your digestion back, and able to process those things. But once you get rid of it, like, hey, you know what? I don't really need that in my life anymore. It's not like the, it's the tastiest things in the world, you know? It's not. <laughs> uh, do you do any, if someone does kind of insist on, oh, no, I really like tomatoes or eggplants or something that uh, that is a nightshade or maybe someone really likes kale i don't know uh do, do you end up um doing some kind of blood work like a, a food sensitivity test or anything like that or do you prefer eliminating first and then if someone really insists when they are all better you're going to do that test how does it go as far as food sensitive or specific food sensitivities Sure. Food sensitivity testing is a good topic to discuss because I really hated it. Oh, <laughs> so I, I don't really, I don't really recommend it anymore. Here's the reason why. Um, when you're actually having food sensitivity issues to, let's just say, anything that's uh, making you bloated, key thing that you need to get rid of is the things that I never have to recommend just before: gluten, casein, corn, soy, right, oxalates, nightshade mm -hmm. vegetables those could end up having to really eliminate or at least to be part of the elimination diet anyway. Yeah. You don't have to spend five to $700 to do a full elimination diet uh, testing. Mm -hmm. And when you're having 
severe anxiety and talking about a specific case, for instance, when you have an anxiety issues to begin with, you worry about everything. The mm-hmm. last thing I need to do is give you a full list of food that's going to be reactive <laughs> to you. And you're basically reacting to everything that I that, that's listed, right? Yeah. Like, and and that also sometimes mess up your relationships to food. Right? Mm-hmm. Everything you're going to be worried about. Oh my God, if I have this, I'm going to react to that. I mean, just get rid of the basic stuff. Let's see how your overall gut function end up having to come into play. I have to get rid of, rid of those things. And then we'll talk about if you're having severe reactions still, then we'll do you know, food sensitivity testing. But at first, I don't really recommend doing so. And second, I do recommend doing detox as well. If you could do something called a fast mimicking diet for the first yeah. five days, I sometimes like to recommend it, but some patients don't want to spend the money. But for $180, and, and there are coupons available, and, and I could definitely provide coupons. And if mm-hmm. any listeners that want to try Prolon, message me on Instagram. I'd be happy to give you my code and, and special link to get a deep discount using Prolon. But fast mm-hmm. mimicking diet, that's literally what it is. It's tricking your body to think that it's going through fasting. And we, I think you probably had several podcasts, uh, episode on fasting in itself because yeah. it's from biohacking, it helps to increase detox, helps to reset your metabolism, increase autophagy, helps to gain your mitochondrial function, helps to go- uh, calm your gut function down. So if you're having gut inflammation, Doing five day course of fast, fast mimicking diet or prolon can be very helpful for you. So those are things that I would end up having to add in. Then we'll discuss about hey, is there anything else that we need to really address? Uh, so those are things that could be easily implemented. And if you're actually having certain food sensitivity to what you know prolon does, obviously you're not the right person for it, but that's one key to do so. Um, mm-hmm. And then helping to overall look at your food differently, right? Looking to food to gain you more therapy rather than trying to, you know, take care of your cravings mm-hmm. for that matter. Um, so, you know, I like to do a higher protein uh, as well as good fat. You, know, you need fat to produce hormones, right? Mm-hmm. We talk about hormones anyway. So you need to have a good amount of fat to help to create hormones, you need to have good amount of protein to help to support your muscle because you, you need to have a proper muscle function to help optimize your hormones and to optimize your insulin function. Yeah. Then when you're looking at other things such as um, supplementations, such as minerals, right, or uh, trace minerals, that's really important. I like to really optimize mi- uh, magnesium, um, zinc, all the things of the nature, vitamin C to support your adrenal function, any adaptogens that we might be needing, eating, mm-hmm. right? So those are key things that I end up having to add in to support the adrenal function. And that in itself can be very different depending on how severe your adrenal fatigue or adrenal uh, stress response is and helping to reset your di- uh, your overall body that way. Interesting. Yeah, that, that sounds like, uh, like something that's going to for sure at least like fix the underlying issues that most people that, that drive most people to, to seek help to begin with. But let's say we we've done all of that, right? We're, we're, we're at phase phase two for that matter. We, we, we balanced, uh, our, our gut microbiome. We, we, we feel that, uh, we're pooping regularly and, and we have a good amount of energy. Um, but we're, we're not 20. Uh, there is, there is, there is uh, a natural decline due to age. Um, what's next? Okay, w- what are we doing now? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's not like there's a step program available. So mm-hmm. uh, ad- adrenal function and gut function has to come into play first and yeah. as well as starting any of the hormones that are needed. Yeah. Usually patients end up having to need progesterone because... Um, because of the standard American diet as it is, inflammation leading into high estrogen level and having low progesterone level, progesterone needs to be optimized. So depending mm-hmm. on the patient's symptoms, you either take a capsule form of a progesterone or a topical form. So give an example. If you're dealing with anxiety issues, not able to sleep that well, right? Those are things that could be taken care of by taking oral form of progesterone Mm-hmm. rather than taking a topical. The reason being is when you're taking an oral form of progesterone, it converts to 17-alpha pregnenolone, which binds to the GABA receptor in your brain. 
Mm -hmm. Right, progesterone has already a natural effect on coming to calming your nerves and as well as helping you promote sleep and as well as giving you a sense of mental health as well. So good way to optimize to using that. Another uh, thing that I could probably add in on top of that is to adding in holy basil, which is another adaptogen, great adaptogen to help with anxiety. So mm -hmm. that's like the two things that I end up to recommend for patients who's going through menopause and having severe anxiety or sleep, sleep issue. Now in dealing with topical progesterone, that is a whole different thing where, you know, optimally you want to give them pro progesterone topically because that's a good way to absorb it, uh, through the skin, through the, uh, and, and helping to get, create a depot effect. So have a slower absorption of progesterone. Unfortunately, if you're dealing with a patient having severe adrenal stress where the cortisol level is very high, what the body's going to do is starts to take the progesterone that's mm -hmm. been applied topically and convert that into cortisol a lot mm -hmm. of times. Or if you actually have a patient who's dealing with adrenal stress, they may end up having to create something called a progesterone steal where, again, topical progesterone that's being applied is going to get converted down to cortisol just to meet the need that the body needs due to adrenal fatigue or having a mm -hmm. low cortisol level. So these are things that we have to look at. In certain cases, I give patients topical or recommend to doctors to give them topical progesterone on top of oral progesterone to optimize it, right? So mm -hmm. that, that's a good way to, I keep saying optimize, but that's what it is. You need to optimize your overall ho hormones and yeah. balancing it out. That's a good way to do so. And then the next phase I look at is how well are you able to um, metabolize your estrogen. So you could do urine testing to check for those things. Sometimes I don't do that except for giving patients a DIM or indole 3 carbonyl to actually help mm -hmm. with the phase two metabolism of the estrogen to get the estrogen out correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing I would end up adding is, or at least go, go back to the gut, probiotic, right? And yeah. then optimizing the digestion profile. So this way your hormones are getting produced and as well as excreted properly. Uh, through that route. So these are things that I would recommend doing. And then the last thing I'll probably look at is testosterone, depending on if they really need the testosterone. When you actually have a patient who's coming in and showing signs and symptoms of insulin resistance and having high testosterone level and low DHEA, uh -huh. that is a sign of inflammation right there, right? Let me repeat that again. Having patients coming in with metabolic issues, right? You knowing that this patient is craving sugar, uh -huh. having severe weight gain, Maybe they're having showing signs of thyroid disorder where they actually have hair falling up in, in large clumps or having to have, you know, fatigue issues and then constantly having to see, you know, breakdown of muscles. And then you see high testosterone level mm -hmm. and having low DHEA, that's a sign of inflammation that's already going on. So there's an insulin resistance going on on top of the fact that these patients are not able to control their sugar level that well. They need to fix their inflammation very quickly, followed by, you know, elimination diet, uh, changing their overall diet to paleo based, right? Mm -hmm. And then having to the, have helping to reset their metabolism. So sometimes adding in the fast mimicking diet could be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Then you're able to see how well they're doing based on their hormone profile when they you, when you end up having to check them in three months later, I would also add in a DHEA. Right. There's yeah. two forms of DHEA. One is a DHEA, which can be converted down to testosterone as a testosterone precursor. And then there's a seven keto DHEA, which is a, a seven keto groups attack, attached to the DHEA group where it actually has been shown to help with metabolism, weight, weight loss. So that's mm -hmm. something that I would probably another to add in. So there's different ways to do so, but it really depends on the patient. So every case that I get is very unique. Uh, and the approach has to be unique to the patient. Do uh, your female patients, uh, do they sometimes uh, get confused when you talk to them about the testosterone? Like, I think, uh, you know, uh, f n most people don't know that, you know, women are estrogen dominant as far as the ratio between uh, testosterone and estrogen, mm -hmm. but that in both men and women, estrogen is, is testosterone is it higher amounts than estrogen in the body? So do they do do you address uh, es um, testosterone in women? Uh, d are they they normally kind of confused? If you do, really depends on the patient with the testosterone. Mm -hmm. 
I don't like to give testosterone when it's not needed. Mm -hmm. Because if you if I see a signs of inflammation, adding an additional testosterone may not be helpful until the yeah. initial inflammation has been calmed down, and then seeing where it goes down to, and then having to see those patients with high testosterone level and low DHEA, and seeing insulin resistance to begin with, yeah. they have severe anxiety. They cannot fall asleep, or they may end up having to fall asleep, but they're waking up in the middle of the night, and then they can't fall asleep because their cortisol level is surging due to the fact that they're sugar level is not being controlled well enough, right? You, when you have mm -hmm. low sugar, when you have a low sugar level, what the body's going to do is increase cortisol level, mm -hmm. right? And trying to uh, start something called the gluconeogenesis to balance and harmonize the glucose level in, in your system. So that's a natural response. So that that's, could be a big problem. And as a result, I this all leads to, again, gut function, how you eat. If you have a high protein intake, and, mm -hmm. and good fat intake, you're able to sustain that glucose response properly through the entire night. So sometimes I recommend patients to eat some um, gluten-free crackers with almond butter to mm -hmm. provide a good amount of fat or have a half of avocado before you guys go to sleep because that's going to provide them the necessary fat they need to sustain the level of sugar that they're looking at throughout mm -hmm. the night. And that's going to be very short-lived. I'm not asking you to <laughs> keep on snacking in the middle of the night. But you may need to, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's just a little bit of a hack that you need to help with that. Now, going back to testosterone, yeah, I, I would probably end up having to utilize testosterone if you need it. But if I see inflammation, I don't like to really give them out until to do so. And high inflammation, high testosterone level, low DHA also cause libido issue to begin with. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's the whole point of giving additional testosterone when you have all these things? Let's go to the uh, testing and then get to the root cause. Yeah, definitely. So when you, uh, you, you did mention in insulin resistance and inflammation, uh, are you uh, mainly checking um, uh, A1C or are you, are you also doing tests for uh, uh, C-reactive protein? Uh, are you doing multiple tests as far as the relationship with uh, glucose or is it gradual? How do you look at it? In an ideal standpoint, I do have patients actually having their labs already drawn and coming mm. for a consultation. And that would also include any time you do a metabolic panel that's going to be seen with A1C level, your insulin yeah. level. Sometimes the doctors don't order that. I still don't know why. Mm -hmm. You always look that. And then as well as their fasting glucose uh, level as well. If the fasting yeah. glucose levels is above 90, that's a problem a lot of times. That's sometimes a sign, signs of uh, insulin resistance going on. Mm -hmm. And their A1C level, trying to see how tightly controlling their sugar response is throughout three months. Mm -hmm. Insulin number could be very helpful as well. And then yeah. when you're looking at how well they are able to you know, respond to food as well, if they feel energized um, right after eating, that's insulin spiking sometimes or having to feel lousy afterwards, that's also another sign of insulin res response as well. So mm -hmm. you, know, you have to look at you know, how you feel after eating or, or before eating. Um, or another thing is, do you feel any reactions after eating? Do you feel bloated? Or another thing is like, hey, like, are you feeling like you're having runny nose after you're eating? That's, a, that's actually a sign of a histamine response. That's uh -huh. not good, right? Interesting. So that I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, insulin, it's a histamine response. So if you do, that could be overall yeast overgrowth. Some doctors end up to go as far as uh, looking at parasites, but you know these are things could be very different from patient to patient. So you have to yeah. work with the right functional medicine doctor, and then looking at you know what's causing all these issues for you. Yeah, interesting. I uh, you reminded me, you know, since since you have the the opportunity or or the or the uh, the position to to kind of walk along uh, with this with the, with your patients along that path. Do you like wearables as far as even a cl continuous glucose monitoring, but uh, uh, but even like looking at uh, how they sleep. Uh, together with it, so matching it with like a, like an aura ring or a, or a bio strap or anything like that. Uh, how far do you go as far as recommending wearables and looking at them when you assess people over time? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I mean, it's there's so many wearables out there these days, and mm -hmm. even this there's an um, app company called Heads Up where they're able to pull every single 
wearable yeah. device data into one single cl uh, cloud service. Mm -hmm. So you're wearing your Aura or maybe you're wearing some Dexcom or Freestyle continuous glucose monitor on top of high, um, your blood pressure monitor you could check and gets everything uploaded that you could easily share those data with your doctor. So mm -hmm. we're in a different picture in terms of what's available for our, as far as the health technology goes. I do like to have patients utilize continuous glucose monitors for a short period of time, not asking them to wear for every single weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's very costly. And there are subscription models available, right? Yeah. Like NutriSense and Inside Tracker is another company that's promoting it. Yeah. But if you want to just see how well you're responding to food, just for two, for two weeks. And there are certainly companies that are providing these uh, free services available where you could just easily have your doctor write a prescription for you. Dexcom tends to be more, more expensive. Yeah. Freestyle tends to be the cheapest, and there are Freestyle 2 and 3 that are much more advanced these days. And you're know, looking at, I think, around, gosh, probably like $180 for you know uh, a month of reading. Yeah. But if you want to just do 14 days, you know, half of that pricing, that's what it comes out to. And then just monitor how well you're responding to your food. Let's just say you have a, a big bowl of oats Right for oatmeal, for instance, in the morning, if your sugar is spiking, well, that's not a good thing to actually have, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to have a higher protein and and good fat in the morning. So ideally, maybe you have two, you know, um, free range eggs with some side of um, avocado and and other maybe small bit of blueberries. That's an ideal breakfast to actually have to sustain yourself. If you want to add an additional meat like steak or uh, maybe cured salmon that could be another thing mm -hmm. if you are really rich rich the rich then have some caviar <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that that is something that i would highly recommend doing and then when you're talking about lunch as well monitor what you're eating if you are just constantly eating salad and, and lunch and then seeing that your sugar level is not responding that well it's not good either you need to have an adequate amount of protein so ideally i have patients eating uh a gram of protein per pound that they have in, in their body. So if they're weighing 120 pounds as a female, then you should, ideally you should have 120 grams of protein, right? And that is that ideally or minimum? It's uh, minimum is 100 grams, but ideally you want to be based on one gram to um, one gram of protein to one gram of fat you're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. so just to really doing so. If you cannot tolerate all that, that's fine. But you know you get you have to get to that level. Um, and certainly if you've got problem issues, then you can digest protein that well. And I, to I totally get that. So slowly introduce that particular aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But you need to have an adequate amount of protein, including dinner, right? Yeah. As for the snacks, you know, if you could actually have certain snacks that are nourishing, like maybe having some, um, you know, nuts on the side and such, that could be very good too. Chia pudding, I love to have as a, as a side snack. Um, because of the fact that chia pudding actually provides all the fiber mm -hmm. and as well as uh, the B vitamins you need and the necessary fat, omega-3, 6, and 9. So it's well, very well balanced. is very therapeutic. So great. Have that as a snack and you can put some blueberries on top of it or other frozen berries. Um, so that could yeah. be very ideal for you. Mentioning, uh, you mentioned the omega-3, uh, 6, and 9. And uh, we were talking before about healthy fats and something that I see a lot of people with uh, co like uh, um, contradicting, opi contradicting opinions is um, olive oil is, you know, there has been a lot of uh, a lot of people promoting it as like uh, an anti-aging uh, sirtuin activator, uh, a way to get more fats into your diet, more calories if you're doing some kind of fasting. Um, uh, some, uh, but other people obviously are looking at the, uh, high ratio of omega sixes to, uh, to other, uh, fatty acids. So, um, what is, what is your, um, take on, on, on olive oil? Yeah, absolutely. Olive oil has been very good for overall human in general. The reason being is actually contains high amounts of polyphenols, antioxidants, and mm -hmm. the healthier fats you're looking for, omega-3 uh, and 6 and 9. One of the things is that you need to find a good quality oil because mm -hmm. you, I, I tell patients that you need to get a single source of olive oil, either you know, getting from a single source of farm, and that's what it comes out to. If, if, is it extra virgin olive oil and it's cold-pressed? Ideally, that's what you want to get. 
and you're able to taste the difference between a, the real olive oil versus the oils that are being cut basically in the United States. They end up having mm-hmm. to add in canola or uh, sunflower oil to cut that down. So yeah, I mean, the olive oil is therapeutic. Uh, there's a lot of um, research behind that. And, and anyone out there that in the biohacking industry, they know that that's, that's one thing that they could definitely recommend doing. And on top of you could end up having to add it in as a you know healthy fat source when you're eating salad instead of actually mm-hmm. using a dressing, put some olive oil on it. Another thing that I've been really diving into is utilizing bioactive oil. Um, mm-hmm. So in using um, safflower oil uh, in, in that sun, such, such that it contains the riboflavonoids that you're looking at, and as well as a well balanced of 41 ratio of omega 6 and 1, and the overall essential needs of linoleic acid. Mm-hmm. I know linoleic acid has been touted as being very bad, but depending on where you're getting it from is a really important part. But also when you look at the phospholipid structure of your cell membrane, mm-hmm. it's comprised of linoleic acid, right? So you cannot just take that out and then and vilify that as a bad thing. Another thing about uh, the omega-3 th- uh, and omega-6 is that o- having too much omega-3 can be immunosuppressive as well. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be taking crap low omega-3, which has been always recommended to take like four to eight grams sometimes to deal with inflammation. Well, what is it doing? It's actually suppressing your overall immune response to yeah. react to the issue that you already have. So that's not ideal either. And having to have a high mass of omega-3, um, again, just repeating again, is, is can be immunosuppressive. It's not ideal. You need to have a good amount of ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 and a four to one ratio. Uh, to help to restructure your cell membrane by using those uh, bioactive oils. Very, very, very interesting. So um, kind of to uh, maybe um, start wrapping things up, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of people listening to this podcast are doing it in the end in order for, for them to have better, better looking skin, more youthful looking skin, uh, healthier skin, etc., we can obviously draw the easy line between gut uh, gut lining function and immune responses that express themselves in the skin. That's that's maybe the easy job. But what do you see when you balance someone's hormones, when someone's eating better? Um, what do you see as far as uh, skin health, the 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 way the skin looks? How can we how can we convince people to 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 you know to take it seriously, basically? Your skin is the largest organ you actually have on your body. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and also it comprises of helping you to detox as well. So, when you're dealing with severe cystic acne, for instance, and mm-hmm. having heavy amounts of blemishes and acne for that matter, there's an underlying issue that's going on right there. Maybe you're not detoxing well, you're, maybe your liver uh, drainage pathway is completely blocked, um, as well as initial issue of inflammation. So, that's a big sign. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is what we commonly see in young female these days. They're coming in, they're having cystic acne all of their um, act on their chin, uh, which is showing a sign of a high testosterone converting to DHEA. Right. And that can be indicative of a lot of times of P- patients dealing with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is called uh, PCOS. That's a sign of an insulin resistance, not just a yeah. hormone problem, there's an insulin inflammation issue that's going on. So you're able to look at these things a lot. So having a, a very healthy, clean skin, right? Not talking about wrinkly skin, but just having clean, bright skin, that shows the fact that your insides are working in an optimal shape and as well as having good amounts of uh, phospholipids that you already need. Right? Mm-hmm. Phospholipids is a building block of your cells. If you're not having good amount of phospholipids as an intake, right? And that can also affect the skin integrity as well as your collagen. Yeah. Um, so that, that has to be done. And you need to have the good amount of fat that you need to have on a daily basis, healthy fat, basically, and protein. Mm-hmm. Um, and then followed by you, if you're drinking plenty of water, right? I think a lot of people are not drinking adequate amount of water mm-hmm. or at least clean water for that matter. So that has to be also be done as well as having a good skin regimen. Uh, I like skin washes that containing ceramides and hyaluronic acid to as, mm-hmm. act as a building block. Uh, I know Young Goose has some phenomenal uh, skincare line. Obviously, mm-hmm. I use it on a daily basis. I mean, my <laughs> skin has been very good. I mean, I, I have a very tip-top shape um, 
uh, skin regimen to begin with. But mm-hmm. ever since I, you guys, I started using your product uh, after the Boston Biohacking Conference, after I, I met, I mean, it makes a humongous difference in terms of the richness of the, the skin. And it's not even oily at all. Like before, I used to be having very uh, oily skin. One thing I noticed that because of the the, the, the phospholipid profile that you guys are able to uh, mm-hmm. have with the, you know, the cream, the care cream that you actually have yeah. there, helps to rebalance the the moisture and as well as the oil production, which I really loved. And you see a big difference in terms of the skin tone as well. So it, it does provide a lot of the inflammation, or at least to provide the anti-inflammatory property that you're looking for. Yeah, we basically, you know, we try to, I mean, no one, no one, um, no one can really make a skincare product for everyone, but we really try to just dial in the cellular mechanisms uh, that, that uh, then pro, you know produce the best functioning skin possible. It's kind of what we were talking about this whole, whole podcast, like going diving deep and trying to understand what are the underlying issues that are going to lead to whatever it is you know better skin, better health, uh, better hormonal profile, etc. So John, I, I think John, what what really uh, is apparent from our conversation is that especially if, if things are a little out of whack, the approach needs to be very individual. There are overall overarching gu- guidelines, but each case is special, especially as it goes along, especially as you see reactions from different things and you need a professional to be looking at them and, and walking you through them. And one of the things that I have I got excited uh, to learn is that you also are consulting people even if they're not in front of you, even if they're virtually in front of you. Uh, how is the, So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that and how that differs from, from a physical um, meeting and consultation. Yeah, I mean, for 14 years, literally, I, I was doing you know, one-to-one you know, consultation at my pharmacy. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trained compounding pharmacist, Company deals with customized medications, so we actually have a lab that we make different doses forms from skincare line to uh, making capsules to transdermal deliveries. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I was starting it out, basically the consultation I was doing a lot of times was dealing with hormones. So one-on-one approach in person was ideal, but now with the technology that's available at this point in time, I'm able to consult patients you know, throughout the United States mm-hmm. uh, and as well as around the world. So that's something that I could help definitely help uh, you know address patients about and and really helping to keep their wellness approach in line and talking about different topics from mm-hmm. hormones to gut function to hormone opti- uh, to immune optimization they're looking at so that those are things that I could definitely provide for people anyone actually wants to you know make an appointment um, they could definitely visit my Instagram page and under the link there is a you know, link to make an appointment or come to my website drkimwellness.com uh, and there's a link for a consultation as well so uh, and pretty soon enough we're actually optimizing our um, our website so this way it's completely AI driven so any you know minimum question you actually answer there will be some supplements that could be you know recommended ideally that's is that going to fix everybody not all but mm-hmm. at least to kind of get you started and then if you need additional help and assistant, assistance for that matter I'm definitely here to help you. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely a privilege to to be able uh, to be able to consult such a professional such as yourself, even if you're not, even if you live in a place that that it's not available, like you have to use the computer, etc. So uh, I'm very glad that that you offer that as well now. And obviously, all of the links are going to be in the podcast this podcast description. And if the I said as I said the one person that doesn't follow you yet it's uh your Instagram page uh is one of my favorite you know bar none so um if you're not following uh, Dr. John Kim again po- the link is going to be in the podcast description um John thank you very 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 much for for dedicating the time uh to be with us here I'm I loved our conversation this was a, a deep conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, sir. All right. Take care.